interview session. Well, I'll start off with some questions and open it up to the floor. And uh, and I'm delighted to have Manuel Blum back. I Manuel Blum was was he, you know long here when I was a new professor, and he and Dick Carp were the role models for lots of uh, young faculty of you know that try to have big impact and at the same time be a very nice person, <laughs> a very humble person, and be a great teacher. Uh, and uh, and then you know not shirk the responsibilities of helping lead the department, both Dick Carp and Manuel Blum were chairs of the CS division. So you kind of uh, set an example that we still follow. So I'm gonna go back. <laughs> uh, so you were born in Caracas, uh, Venezuela. I was born in Caracas. I learned English in the Bronx. <laughs> in the Bronx. I, I, when? when? Uh, well, I knew I was gonna go into first grade. And so I knew that I will have to learn English. And I saw two women speaking to each other at the, in, in the corner. And so I went there and tried to stand with my back to them so they didn't know I was eavesdropping. <laughs> and I remember telling myself, it's perfectly clear memory, I will never learn this language. <laughs> they speak much too fast for me. <laughs> the funny thing about it is, I, I remember those words exactly in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and then, did you have brothers and sisters, or, or other relatives in Venezuela? Uh, yes, yeah, so I had uh, I had brothers, uh, two two brothers, and. Um, but uh, I came to this country actually when I was four. When you were four, okay. But my first language was German, which I spoke in Venezuela where nobody speaks German. And when we came to this country, nobody liked to hear German because uh, they were fighting the Germans in the war. So my parents started speaking to me Spanish. At the time, nobody in the Bronx spoke Spanish. <laughs> That's changed. That's changed. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then, uh, so after this experience, in the second grade, um, or first or second grade, there was a parent-teachers conference, and um, the teacher told my mother, this is a pretty dumb kid. Well, she didn't say, <laughs> she didn't, she didn't say that. She said, he may be able to get through high school, but he will not be able to get to college. Uh, that's, that's amazing. My eighth grade teacher told my mom the same thing. <laughs> and I, well, I can tell you what my mom's reaction was. My mom was angry. My mom was furious that, that he would say that thing. And, and if, she, if she could have, she would have punched him in the mouth. <laughs> and I think she wished she could uh, let him know that I won the Turing Award, look him up and tell him. What, what was your parents' reaction? To, did they believe what the teacher said? Uh, no, no, no. She was sure that I was smart. I just didn't didn't know the language. Didn't know language. And so, um, uh, so she told the teacher. The teacher said, "Why don't you speak to him in English?" And my mother said, uh, "But I don't speak English." <laughs> she said, "But that. Why do you think you're talking to me?" <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, did, did your uh, so you ended up going to MIT from the Bronx. Right. Well, from the Bronx, uh, then oh. back to Venezuela. Oh, you went back to Venezuela. Oh. Venezuela, and then, and then I had to. Uh, uh, my parents wanted me to go to college in this country, so they sent me to a military school. Oh. I, West I, Point. <laughs> no, for high school. For high school. Mil military oh. school. That was. Wow. Peak School Military Academy, which is a terrible place. <laughs> Terrible, but I did learn some th important things there. I learned how to hypnotize people. <laughs> <laughs> While you were in high school, you learned to hypnotize people. And, and it was a great place to do it in a military school because I found that I could hypnotize one in three people. <laughs> That's about the ratio. And when I went to MIT, I couldn't hypnotize anybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think that's, there's a commentary there. <laughs> uh, did uh, did what about your brothers? Did they go to go to uh, what, what happened? To, did they go to military school and they went to the, they went to military school, yeah, um, and then they went out, they went in, in different directions. So are are you, are you the only person that went to grad school or I'm the only yes I'm the only one. Uh, I, 
I, I'm the only one that went into academia. Now, you have to understand that my father was totally against anything like that. Uh, during, during, this was World War II times, I once stood up at the dinner, I once at the dinner table told, I was interested in brains, so I told, I, 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 I told my father that um, I've decided I'm going to be an anthropologist. Somehow I thought that anthropology had to do with the brains. Oh, no, this, is, this is when you're six or seven years old. It was exactly when I was in fourth grade. Fourth grade, okay. Yeah. And I remember my father standing up at the table, and the only time I ever saw him stand up at the dining room table and saying to me in the strongest words possible, you will not be an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> Anthropologists are professors. And professors can't make a living. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> there's, there's some truth to that, that still today. I, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that in English too. You remember that in English too. Uh, all right. So then, so then you went to MIT. So then, from the military academy, you must have applied at multiple places. How, how did you decide to go to MIT? Well, uh, I applied to Caltech, and they didn't take me, and. Uh, MIT did. I was very happy that I managed to get there. Um, and then you, so that was great for me. Yeah, and so you got your bachelor's in 59, master's in 61, and you worked with Marvin Minsky to get a PhD in mathematics in 64. I'm going to tell you about the, my first year at MIT. Y your, your freshman year? My freshman year. Okay. Uh, because, um, you, you know, I, I told you I went to this military school, and the way you learn stuff in military school is you memorize. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I remember, so as a freshman at MIT, I didn't know that there was any other way to do it. I would memorize. And a friend of mine, I, I did very badly. My, in, I worked very hard on physics, and my first grade in physics was a D minus. Wow. A, was, a, a, mercy, a mercy grade, a D minus. Yeah, a D minus. You know, even <laughs> C is usually a mercy grade. Well, he didn't fail you. He gave you a D minus. Okay. He didn't fail me. And uh, what was great was that uh, the per a friend of mine came in and saw me at some point memorize, you know, these physics books. They had these formulas uh, with boxes around them. So I, it was clear that it's what's in the box is important and should be memorized. And he came in and said, what are you doing? Look, you want a formula. If you need something, you derive it. All you need is F equals MA and a little more. And anything you need, you derive it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> and that was life-changing for me. Life-changing experience, yeah. Absolutely life-changing. It was great. My brothers still don't know that. <laughs> uh, and then, so was it going to to get a PhD? Was that a hard decision, or going to grad school was a hard decision, or it just seemed obvious? Um, well, no, no uh, it was clear that I would be, go to grad school. I started off in electrical engineering. Uh, that was in some, you know, I wanted to build a robot. Okay. So I, started, I wanted to understand brain, so I went into electrical engineering to do that. I took a course uh, with R Richard Schoenwald uh, on uh, uh, psycho Freud, actually. He's a historian of Freud, because I thought that at least would get me close to brains. And uh, the great thing about that is that uh, at uh, some point he uh, uh, told me uh, that there's a wonderful neurophysiologist that has just come to MIT named Dr. Warren S. McCulloch, and that I should go and introduce myself to him. So I read uh, some of the, his papers, and then I did go in to introduce myself. And I remember that uh, when I came in and I told him I wanted to work with him, he pointed to a, a um, uh, books on his shelf. He said, read these first. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just was not about to read that stuff. So uh, <laughs> what I did is um, he, he was writing some interesting papers on how neurons might, uh, might be uh, 
uh, how, how you might construct circuits that would take care of errors. Mm -hmm. And I was able to prove a nice theorem. And once I had proved the theorem, then I was in. <laughs> and he was my real mentor, this oh, he was. Yeah. He, he, the, this business of building circuits that would work was great at the time because, you know, our computers, they, uh, if they, uh, they needed air conditioning to work. And it was the, the TX0 would last for five minutes and then you'd have to restart it because of the errors. Yeah, there's too unreliable. Too unreliable. And he pointed out that, you know, this, this, this circuit, which doesn't have air conditioning especially, <laughs> that it works very well despite the fact that the thresholds are fluctuating. You drink alcohol and the threshold goes up. Mm -hmm. And you drink coffee and the threshold goes down. <laughs> and despite all this, you could, you, you could, it can still work. I mean, at least he, his brain would still work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been interested in brain since you're six years old. And your talk today is about AI. So is this like a lifetime interest for you? This is very much a lifetime interest, yeah. Uh, again, because, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that in first grade, second grade, I was a very dumb kid, and I really wanted to be smarter. And um, so I asked my father what, what I could do to be smarter. And, uh, no, I asked him what I should do to be able to memorize. I couldn't memorize. I didn't. You that, couldn't memorize that, and you went to, they sent you to a military academy. <laughs> I couldn't memorize. I realized later what the problem is. is. See, I have in my classes now at CMU, there are many Chinese students. And I have the same trouble with their names. I can't remember them. It's a different language. It's very hard for me. But uh, I will. I, I will. But I think what happened, what, I couldn't memorize because I didn't know the language. Did, sure, sure. It's hard. Makes it hard. Yeah, it makes it hard. <laughs> Um, so you, uh, so you got your PhD in mathematics in 64 and you, I think you said you came to Berkeley four years later. Uh, did, we didn't finish with... Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I mentioned working with McCulloch. Oh, that's right. Who was... Your mentor. My real mentor. He oh. and Walter Pitts. And this is while you were undergrads or...? Yeah, I, I started work, I went in to introduce myself when I was a junior. And I worked uh, there in this neurophysiology lab till after I had uh, gotten my PhD. Oh, cool. So it was very nice. So why did, why did they mention Marvin Minsky? He was my thesis advisor. So McCulloch and Pitts were my mentors. Uh, you know, I learned from them the way I learned from this friend of mine who came in and said, you don't memorize. Okay. So Walter Pitts told me, anything you want to know, you can get from books. Now, nowadays, he would say anything you want to know, you can get from Google. That's an, obviously, that's uh, uh, extreme because not everything you want to know. Uh, you're all doing research because there are some things that you can't get when you Google for it, but a lot you can get. And this was wonderful. That was another eye-opening experience, how wonderful it is to have Google nowadays to answer all sorts of wonderful questions. But th at that time, um, we didn't have Google, we had libraries, and every so often the library would tell, ask Walter to bring back some of those books, <laughs> <laughs> and he'd get a wheelbarrow, seriously a wheelbarrow. a wheelbarrow. I see him walking down the halls with a wheelbarrow, wow. holding all the books that he'd taken out and had to be t taken back. <laughs> so from there, let's see, so that, then I, I decided I really wanted to get into some mathematics that would help me to understand the brain. And I went into something called logic and recursive function theory. There was no computer science at the time, so I couldn't do that. And, um, and probably logic and recursive function theory are the wrong things. But at the time, it seemed to me that that might give me some understanding of uh, the brain. And, uh, and it was uh, then when I went into uh, the math department from the electrical engineering that I then got uh, Marvin Minsky is a thesis advisor, and um, Hartley Ro Rogers was another person in this area of logic and recursive function theory. And is that where you did your dissertation? And, and that's what I—that's where I did my dissertation in that area. Okay. 
Sorry, right. I don't let you ask the question. No, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but so that's 1964. Uh, you come to Berkeley in 68. What what happened between 64 and 68? Uh, well, I was an assistant professor at MIT. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, oh boy, you were you were a lifer. You were bachelor's, master's, PhD, yeah. prof professor. Right, right. So I was a professor there too. And in '68, Lenore got her PhD. At, at uh, MIT. At MIT, and then we could find try to find jobs. And so you had together. a two-body problem to try and find a job. Is that yeah, that that was a serious problem. And uh, the way we solved it is, I got the job, and she did what she could. Uh, uh, she worked at uh, Mills. She went. She found. A, yeah, she she got a. She was initially here in the math department, and then she started the math computer science department at Mills. First math, com first computer science department in any uh, woman's college. Oh, cool. Anyway, um, let's see. But then, uh, so uh, you, I don't know. Is is your first big result the do, finding? Do you can do a median in linear time, or you know, I'm a novice at this. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's okay. The, so uh, that's a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first result was the, the thesis, which had, uh, which proved uh, something that is badly called the speed-up theorem, which um, basically says that. Uh, so we, I was interested in computing functions and lower bounds, and it turns out that there are some functions which we, which is very hard to get really good lower bounds. And basically proving that something like matrix multiplication, you know how matrix multiplication order n cube steps, it's been brought down to n to 2.3. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been gradually going down. With, and basically the theorem was basically saying that something like that uh, may never get to order n squared. Mm -hmm. That there are, that would be an example of speed up where n to the 2.3 would become n to the 2.2, it would become n to the 2.15, and you'd never get down to n never squared. And that does happen for some functions. Was that, so which, was that, for that, getting the Turing Award, was that one of the results, or it, it was, was several things? It was forgotten by then. What? No, that, that was, did not play a role at all. That did not play a role, okay. <laughs> I said, when, what was the result that led to the Turing Award? No, no, that's an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. You have no idea because you didn't write the nomination. Uh, uh, what I can tell. Which, do you know what? No, oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, so I can tell you this for sure. The only thing I've been interested in lately uh, re that I've really been thinking about is something very close to brains. Uh, consciousness. Close. Consciousness. Okay. Consciousness. And uh, in, my, in my talk, I'll mention this. So I'll tell you a sp specific problem that comes up in this. Uh, it's called the problem of qualia. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a particular example of this. We, you, um, we as engineers, as computer scientists, know how to build a robot so that it looks, simulates pain and fear and joy. It, you, we know how to build these things so that they can that simulate these feelings. We don't know how to build them so that they actually feel it. And the question is, where the hell do the feelings come from? We, how do you build something so that it actually feels the joy of music, the joy of first love, the pain when you tear a, a ligament? How, how do you do that? Wow. And that, that was, uh, that's the problem that I'm especially interested in. And you can get a sense of how the, the problem because there are some kids that are born with a disorder called pain asymbolia. You can look up asymbolia, but you won't find it there. It has to be pain asymbolia. And it's this weird name for it. If you have pain, if you're born with pain asymbolia, you know about pain. You can get pinched, and you'll know where you're being pinched, how hard you're being pinched, if the temperature's uh, strange, very hot, very cold. You know everything that anybody knows about that, but it doesn't bother you. 
you don't suffer. Huh. You don't suffer. Wouldn't you like to have that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it might, it might, uh, it, there'd be times it'd be great, but it might not be good for you because pain that, plays a warning role. <laughs> uh, this is a good point. <laughs> exactly so. So kids that are born with this rarely live past the age of three. Past three? Yeah, that, that's about it. By the time they're three, there was uh, a young girl that, the beautiful girl, you see the picture of her, her as a child. Parents really wanted to keep her around. And in fact, she, they were able to. Um, but in order to do this, they had to, for example, remove all her teeth. Wow. Yeah, because she was biting, she had bitten off the end of her tongue and her lips were going. And uh, it was just a terrible thing. But by the time she was seven, she already knew that she must pay attention to pain. Her parents made it clear, if you feel, because it was pain as embolia, she knew uh, about pain. She just, just didn't bother her. So they told her, if you feel that you have pain somewhere, you are to stop whatever you are doing and uh, get back here. And... Uh, so this kid was out playing ball, some kind of ball, and she was having fun, and she, her leg went into a hole, and she broke her leg, and she knew that she'd broken her leg, but she was having fun. And now when you see a picture of her, you see one leg is shorter than the other, because hmm. she didn't go back to have it taken care so of. So she became an adult? Um, the last I knew, she had reached the age of 13. Wow. Okay. So, but so you think consciousness is is, is tied to these un, understanding the, these feelings? Yeah, that, it's being able. The, the question of being able to understand this feeling of pain is really a lot of what I want okay. from consciousness. Lenore, who's my co-author on this and is every bit as much into this as I am. She can't understand why I'm working with pain. She wants to understand joy. <laughs> <laughs> Truly feel joy. <laughs> she, she'll be giving, in fact, the talk I'll give here, she will be giving in Beijing. Uh, in November, I'll be teaching our class, and she'll be giving the talk. And there, you would find out about how the body uh, achieves joy. Okay, so we're stuck with your, with your sad version of consciousness. Uh, uh, so um, be, I should open it up for uh, qu uh, questions, but I, I, I think on, I honestly think you're the best uh, PhD advisor I've ever met. <laughs> and uh, it, did you? Did is it just? come naturally to you? Do you know that you do anything special as a, what, what, do you have a philosophy for advising mentors? I, I try to simulate my mentor, Warren S. McCulloch. Okay. Dr. McCulloch. He was just very supportive, very, have you ever heard the, um, the do you know the poem, The Snark, The Hunting of the Snark? Uh, Vail Kahan, of course, has, because he knows everything, so. Uh, uh, let's see if I can say something. Uh, well, I'll just start. It's a long poem. It's a wonderful poem, if you've ever had it. And uh, the, 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 the hunting of the snark, there's a captain who is uh, running this ship, and uh, uh, in the poem, you, you discover that the only thing he knows about how to get to uh, the snark is to j uh, uh, jingle his bell. He has a bell. They call him the bellman. And he's wise. He, uh, be uh, lovely carriage. Uh, very uh, McCulloch actually looked like him. <laughs> and, uh, but he doesn't know how to do anything. So that's me. That's you? <laughs> you ring the bell? <laughs> ring the bell. The students know. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I uh, that's. Uh, it turns out. I, I, let me just try this out. Manuel Blum has something called advice to a beginning graduate student, or what is research, or the four R's of graduate school: reading, ri reading, arithmetic, research, and, and writing. Kind of four R's. <laughs> <laughs> have they, how many people have read this? How many students read this? 
A few, right? The Turing Award winner has given advice to first year grad students. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's really uh, remarkable of all kinds of pro thought provoking advice. So I encourage you to do that. But uh, I think what I'll do is now open up the floor to questions and uh, see what you'd like to learn from the, f the person who got this all started, the first of the people who did Turing Award research at Berkeley. Manuel. Yes. <laughs> His name is Manuel, too. Oh, yeah. Cool name. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think I should give you the microphone. Yeah. Um, I guess kind of just to what you were asking earlier, um, kind of, you know, uh, as equally impressive as the work is just your advising record, just the people that have come out of been mentored by you. So like um, you said, you've mimicked uh, your, your mentor, William, what, in, in what McCulloch. way? McCulloch. McCulloch? Dr. Warren S. McCulloch. Okay, yeah. yeah. In, in, in what way? Or like what... Uh, what exactly did you mimic mentoring wise that you think is He was so very supportive. Really? Okay, so that's the key. You think? The key is support. The, the students uh, that I work with, the key is that we should enjoy each other. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and just being supportive. So supportive and um, that's all I know. You know. I don't know very much, Manuel. <laughs> I, uh, but I know you do some, I, rem I remember you saying something like, uh, while somebody's getting a PhD student, getting their PhD, they should take one class every quarter then. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That, well, you see, because remember the D minus I got. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I discovered that uh, at least as a graduate student, I was required to take two courses. I would take two and drop one. <laughs> And that way, I, I as a grad student, it. as a grad student, yeah, that was very important for me. That that would enable me to actually go very deeply into that one. Yeah, I mean, the other. I'm not suggesting that you should do that. That, uh, that I'm just telling you what worked for me. Okay, it sounds like you're offering advice. <laughs> in this, in this, uh, you talk about uh, reading books by sampling rather than from cover to cover. Uh, it's true. Uh, so um, when I get a math book, you know, the usual thing you might do is start at the beginning and work your way through. Uh, I found that the following works for me uh, even better. I try to open up the math book to something I can understand. Usually the book is full of stuff. I have no idea what it's about. I try to find something I can understand and then that uses some words that were defined earlier, I can go back. So I just open up to various different places trying to find, and it's amazing how with this, I can eventually get to read at least half of the book. <laughs> and uh, that's worked for me, because the other approach of starting at the beginning leaves you with lots of books of which you've read the first half of the first, yeah. half of the first chapter. Yeah, yeah. And set aside, okay. All right, let's see. Other questions? I, oh, come on. This is the theory lunch. So give, give, <laughs> give, give them time. Yeah. Uh, so I come from a physics background, so forgive me if I'm unfamiliar with your work. But um, my question is that um, you say you were interested in brain. Uh, what have you discovered in your career about a uh, brain that was not known before and has, you know, increase our understanding of uh, how the brain functions? Uh, oh, very good question. So, so you, you know, I'm a theoretical computer scientist, uh, computer scientist so I've, uh, the, the question I ask myself is uh, how to build a, a model of the brain that's very simple, that I could actually try to define stuff and prove theorems about. And um, what I'll talk about will be that model. It's based on what the, uh, the uh, cognitive neuroscientists tell us, so it's not just coming out of n nowheres, but it's an attempt to make it formal. I call it the conscious Turing machine, although people say it doesn't look anything like a Turing machine, which is true. And the cognitive neuroscientists tell me, well, this, what kind of a model is that? The brain is complicated. There's a lot going on. Uh, you know, many different kinds of memories, for example. And in this model, I'm trying to get the very simplest model so I can try to understand something about this consciousness and try to understand where, for example, the suffering in pain comes from. 
what have I learned? What sort of things you, you can learn from this? I, uh, I've learned that all the hard work, we are conscious, you see, of what we see, what we hear. Uh, we're conscious of our inner speech. All of us speak to ourselves. Isn't that wonderful? You speak to yourself uh, in, your, in your mind. You may, you may have different languages, but you are always speaking to yourself. So we are conscious of that. We are conscious of our dreams. If, if you've ever had lucid dreams, you would see um, some wonderful stuff. And, um, and so one of the things that's come out of this is a realization that all the heavy lifting is being done unconsciously. Absolutely hmm. unconsciously. And I have uh, many quotes of people. I just heard one from Umesh, um, a, a quote from Ramanujan, who felt that the ideas came to him from uh, one of the goddesses. The ego. The... You know, his special. <laughs> there was a, he had a relationship with this. This particular goddess, he had a relationship with her. So one of the things I've discovered is that you want to solve a problem, you spend your time trying to get that problem as clear as you can. Because you're not going to solve it. It's your unconscious hmm. brain that's going to solve it. So you get it as clear as you can and then let it rip. So get the problem statement as clear as you can. Get the problem statement. Think about it enough that you can get things going. And once you do that, you will be surprised. You know, there are these examples like Poincaré stepping up on, on the step of a bus. You know the story of Poincaré, mathematician. He's out having a vacation. He gets up on the, as he puts his foot on the first step of the bus, the idea how to do something comes to him. And he said he has no idea where it's coming from, but that's because it's coming from underneath. You see, somewhere down deep, heavy work has been done to come up with this idea he's been looking for. And uh, you have uh, quotes from, so I haven't got the quote from Ramanujan uh, uh, from, uh, from, um, okay, yet, but uh, I, I, you know the first computer scientist was Gauss. So, I have a quote from Gauss, exactly that, that he's basically saying, thanks to God, this problem that I've been working and working on and couldn't get anywhere, suddenly the idea pops into my head. He has no idea where, where it came from or what was the conducting thread to bring it. It's like stepping up on a bus. Do, do you get... When do you get your good ideas? Do, is there a time of day or anything, or they just can any, any time? I guess. Well, I'm. You're, you're assuming I get good ideas. Okay. <laughs> when do you get the ideas that you write about, about or talk about? Because for me, I notice it's uh, in like three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. It's I've uh, you know I've been exposed to ideas. I've been thinking about the problem. I go to bed, and I think that's why they're saying to sleep on it. And it's almost always in the early morning hours, you know, with my eyes half open, that you know, things pop into my mind. That's my normal. Is it like that for you, or? I like the idea of working at three in the morning. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> it could be because it's very late. <laughs> yeah. Or it could be yeah. because it's very early. Some people like it early. But, or late. Uh, yeah. but it's great because the phone doesn't ring. Yes, that's true. Sure. And, uh, and, and that, that's, that's kind of nice. Okay. Well, uh, for me, it used to be very early. And then I would, uh, uh, no, no, how, how was it? No, no, I would go to sleep very late. For me, it used to be very late. Uh -huh. And then I was here in Berkeley, and they gave me a course to teach at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember having to think, am I going to stay up? until I teach the class and then go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> or am I going to actually get up at normal hour and teach the class? This was very upsetting to me, but I'm sure. Uh, nevertheless, I did that semester I switched around and now I get up early in the morning, I go to sleep at 8. And, oh, so and now you that that forced you to switch. That, for, I'm sure I could be switched back. <laughs> that, so we teach you, give you an eight o'clock a class, night class or something. Yeah, yeah, switch yeah. around. Um, let's, let's see more questions. 
Carlo. Carlo. I would like to point out that Manuel is the person that's mostly responsible for the good spirit that we have in a computer science division. I think he really set the example and said, you know, we have to talk to one another, we have to form one family, then we hire young faculty, we select them very, very carefully, and then there's no problem. They will get tenure because we support them and we do everything we can. And I followed Manny as, as chair and he passed on that advice and says, Carlo, that's what you have to look out for, right? And I did that and I hope I passed it on. And I think it still lingers around. I mean, one thing that still lingers around is faculty lunch. Dave brought the idea back home from, um, from DEC or from wherever he was in sabbatical. I introduced it in 1982 and they're still doing it. And that's a wonderful thing because 85% show up for faculty lunch. You call a faculty meeting, 30% show up, right? <laughs> so we get together, we, we, we socialize, and then we start discussing problems. And if we don't finish, we just continue the following Monday. And so most of our decisions are reached by consensus, not by a 49 to 51 vote. And I think that is really Good. why for a long time computer science was one of the best departments in terms of internal collegiality and, and, and working together. It helped a and lot that uh, you so came to the department and that my, Dave came to the department. Yeah, we're well, supposed to ask a question. My question is, when you went to CMU, did you carry that good spirit and did you have equally good seats there? Oh, oh they, ha they have very good spirit there. Great. They have this um, reasonable person principle, which is a, something that they put up uh, in signs that we assume you are a reasonable person. <laughs> that. Um, Basically, as long as it's reasonable, we, we, we go along with it. I, I was going to do another uh, testimonial. Uh, I think uh, uh, possibly, you know, at this is back when Manuel was uh, ch chair. So, so what happened, there were two computer science departments at Berkeley. There was EECS and there was one in LNS. And in about, I guess, 75, they were forced to merge together. So. In 73, they were forced to merge together. So that was kind of upsetting. And so Berkeley was not one of the top three. That was Stanford, number one, and then either Carnegie Mellon or MIT was number two, and we were a distant fourth. And so could we recover from that? And Man I think of Manuel Blum's tenure as chair was the, th was the turning point. And the, t the turning point was the recruiting of John Osterhout. John Osterhout was unquestionably the number one draft choice in the country. Everybody wanted to hire him. And with Manuel Blum there as chair, and he, like all things, he took it very seriously. And so he spent all his time trying to think is, how can I get Osterhout to come to Berkeley? And so one of the things he did is contact Osterhout about something negative that had happened at Berkeley, something bad had happened at Berkeley. And he just, Manuel sent it to him and says, I just think you should know about this at Berkeley before you come. And this piqued Osterhout's interest. <laughs> and, and then he, uh, and he kept, uh, and then he really enjoyed it, and Manuel, you know, and, and, and he didn't quite understand why he wanted to come to Berkeley, but he wanted to come to Berkeley. And he kind of, he, he told everybody he was going to Berkeley, and they all didn't understand why he was doing it. Uh, but it made people th wonder if something good was going on, uh, going on at Berkeley. And I think that was the point, and then after that, at, after Osterhout came, then, you know, lot, it was a lot easier to get really great, uh, really great people to come. Uh, but Man Manuel was the person, that I think, that made that shift to get going, going forward. Uh, so, We're out all right. Of time. We're out of time. Okay. With that, I think this is kind of a preview for the talk this afternoon. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>